<laughs> okay, so we start off with parallel well, assuming you know this from chemistry. Uh, pressure, volume, number of moles, temperature, and gas constant 8.31 joules per, per mole. Per uh, for particle Kelvin, you multiply by the dominant number. Uh, we assume that the gas is confined so that NR is constant. This is a gas law. Uh, this is the ideal gas law. It doesn't apply to every gas. You get too many molecules there, they get in each other's way, and they take up volume. You assume that the volume of all the molecules is much less than the volume of the container. They start getting crowded. That's good. Okay. And other things. Um, so, if N is constant, R is a constant, then NR is constant. So, PV over R is just constant. That's what PV over T is constant. Um, meaning, of course, you know PV and T, you can figure out how many moles you have. If you know the molar mass, you know the opposition of the gas, you know the molar mass, you can call them, or remember the um, uh, atomic numbers. And, and you've got that. Uh, okay, anyhow, if T is constant, then we get PV equals NRT, which is constant. No, I said, okay, what's the graph of this thing look like? No, what is Graph. Okay, or if anybody did it, was the right one. Okay, so why not? Well, there's a simple connection for calculus, but you got to make the connection. Once you make the connection, it's obvious what this graph has to look like. So, what's the connection? The connection turns out to be one of your five most basic functions for pre calculus, ones that you really need to understand to understand a lot of what you see in physics. Graphs, relationships, and other things. So you really need to make sure you totally understand those things. You got the squaring function, reciprocal function, which is this one, reciprocal square, which would be a square in this, like you know, square, which is going to be really important soon. Okay, it's already important for gravitation. Uh, now the cubing function, um, and I don't remember what I've listed, but you got. Square and cube and reciprocal, reciprocal square and exponential. Exponential functions are really important. Okay, so we got this one. Now, as soon as I said that, well, let's graph that with one, but look like this. Well, so there's a graph of this. Why? Because Is a constant divided by v. Well, if this is y equals one over x, if it's y equals c over x, and c is a constant, the graph still looks like this. You might have to change your labels in the y axis where one used to be, now you've got c. Or if you just want to keep your scale with one here, then you're going to have to stretch it or compress it to accommodate c. Well, that's all stuff people really need to carry out of pre-calculus. Unfortunately, pre-calculus generally devolves into course in algebra one and a little algebra two. Uh, so you don't carry across, you don't carry out pictures of the functions. You want to, you want to kind of focus on that. Uh, understanding those very basic functions is really kind of a key. Understanding just a whole lot of the formulas Phenomena you see in physics or elsewhere. So, anyhow, the graph's going to look like that. Now, the scale is that depends on the bigger constant is. Okay. Okay, a couple of things about this now. Uh, and, and also, if you just think about it, you understand that if P times V is constant, then if one of these gets bigger, the other has to get smaller. Okay. They can't both get bigger because it wouldn't be constant. Multiply bigger by bigger, it's bigger than it was. Not constant, not the same. If one gets bigger, you can go multiply the two and get the same thing you have. The other has to get smaller. Okay, 
That's just a fundamental level of the way numbers work. Okay. Um, so make sure you're kind of conversing with that idea. It's, it's, it's really important. Um, now, a couple of things. I've shown you some diagrams. And of course, you know, it's not over over the calculus tomorrow. We're going to start talking about quadric surfaces. There's surfaces that go along with this. The surface goes along with this equation. I just showed you the picture of it, didn't explain it, but I'm going to start explaining it in a way that's going to articulate nicely with what we do in molar over calculus. Um, If we start changing T, that changes the constant. So you have P and P. It's not, not a very good graph, but that, it looks something like this. Um, it's more like a reciprocal square, but okay. So just get the basic idea. Uh, the shape was a little better than it was when I screwed it up. Uh, okay, so. This is for one T, okay? So for some T. Now, if T gets bigger, what's the graph look like? Show me. If this is this is a graph of P versus V for one T, what is it for bigger T? Okay, well, everybody, I don't do it right now. Still confined, but for increasing T. All right. Okay, well, we put that into three dimensions if we wanted to, couldn't we? Okay. We could. Now, this is not going to be a right hand coordinate system, but in order to get a basic picture, okay, let's say for one T, the graph is here. And the PV plane for T. We don't want to say T is zero here. So I'm kind of fudging a little bit, but I just want to get the basic shape of this thing. Now, if we go out to a bigger T, let's say here's like a PV axis, the T is bigger. Well, then the graph might be much higher like this. Okay. And in between, it would not have one. Here is so let's see this this graph is in this plane. Then we have another one maybe in this plane. Uh, I don't even want to try to draw it. We understand that somehow the curve here is going to be increasing from here to here. Okay, that makes sense. Um, well. Take a look at that picture on the one upper right hand on the second page. Can you see that in the picture? Okay, if V is constant, then P and T are the things that vary. So I want P and T on one side and everything else is going to be constant. So You know, the team's constant. The P is a constant times T. What's a graph of P equals a multiple of T, constant multiple of T look like? 
Oh, uh, and yeah. And straight line, right? This is a straight line through the order. There's a simple proportionality. P over T is constant. If T increases by 5%, so does P. Otherwise, it wouldn't be constant, right? We have to understand that about these functions. Otherwise, we don't understand the basic functions. Everything is built on, okay? So make sure we think about that. I can't teach that in here. Go back to what I'm doing in my pre calculus class right now, but to review pre calculus, you don't need me to explain that to you, okay? But it really goes back to pre calculus. One reason I'm working hard with pre calculus as well as the more advanced courses uh, is that's the root of all evil. It's the root of the fact that it's the root of most of the problems people have with the mathematical aspect of physics and with calculus. And it perpetuates. People don't know pre-calculus very well, so they don't know calculus very well. Don't know calculus very well. When we get to my multivariable calculus class in Dharma, you're gonna know it, <laughs> okay? And you will. Everybody's up here has been doing very well. So I'm gonna try to remedy all evils. Okay, uh, it helps. You know, learn a lot in your differential equations and stuff. You know, with a lot of that stuff. Uh, okay, so anyhow, uh, we have all this. Okay, P is a constant multiple of T. So depending on your constant. Increase in constant goes this way, right? So increase in constant gives you steeper and steeper graph. What makes a constant increase? Okay. Not sure how much of that I record up as much. So, you know, we got P equals NR over B for these constant. P equals NR over B, mass of constant. So P is a constant times T. It's a constant multiple of T, which means the straight line through the origin, the slope being equal to the constant. So for increasing constant, we get increasing slope. So the increasing constant goes this way. Now, what makes the constant increase? Volume decreases. So decreasing volume, the graph gets steeper and steeper. And why is that? Well, you're confining the gas to a smaller and smaller volume. You get more and more pressure. Okay. Uh, and of course, we're talking about the same gas. Well, implications here. Okay, here is the constant volume. Okay, so constant volume it's along an axis goes something like this, right? Okay. Now let's say if this volume, this slope of the graph is like this. So the graph is going to It didn't look like so, and let's get rid of that extra part, though, okay? It's starting to look like a picture in your textbook, okay? Now, so a smaller volume, so we've got a smaller volume here. We come out to the same plane like we have a plane and we've kind of lost track of, but we've got a plane here. Like we got a V prime axis here and a P prime axis here. Okay. So we come out to this plane to get up to the graph. We got to go up at a pretty steep angle. Okay. So we can draw a line from here to there. That's clearly steeper than this. That corresponds to one of these steeper lines, a lesser volume. 
line gets steeper, and this line is hidden behind, let's say, this surface here. So let's just say we just shade all this and then make it more or less solid. But we still got enough of this that we can see. So we get a steeper line. And then we get steeper and steeper lines. We keep going up. Okay. That's not a great graph. I hate to show how. Okay. I didn't make a really great graph. Uh, but we've got like P versus T curves and keep going steeper and steeper. P versus B curves. Keep getting steeper and steeper. And we get to where we actually have a reasonable construction of these graphs. Okay. And if we project the graph, remember this axis here, which is hidden by all this stuff. Here's our T axis, right? So if we want P versus T, we just put a P versus T axis out here and project these straight lines, okay? That's a picture does. The picture is much better than what I can draw. Uh, if we project on a P versus V diagram, we get these curves here. Looks like this. And P versus T is going to look like this. P versus V is going to look like this. Helps us understand the picture. Uh, it's a much more complicated picture for an ideal gas. And well, you run the temperature up high enough, and the thing's going to start turning to vapor. Okay. Going to start turning to gas. Freeze it. Yeah, and when you decrease the temperature enough, it's going to turn into a liquid. Pretty much any gas does that. Okay. Uh, and the diagram gets a whole lot more complicated. We'll probably talk about that. Let's we'll just start with this. Okay. Something about the pressure versus volume diagram. Or, uh, what? Okay. Pressure is in Pascal's. But that's newtons per square meter. We got to remember what Pascal's are. Okay. So, so yeah. didn't remember that instantly, but reasoned it out. Okay. And that was good. Okay. The volume is in cubic meters. So, Areas in what units? I'm saying that. Pressure. Yeah. Newtons per square meter. Volume in cubic meters implies that pressure times a change in volume is in. Newton meter, and that is good. Okay. Um, Area represents work done by the gap. Actually, 
Anyhow, I think in terms of the work done by the gas, we kind of have to know how it is that the gas doesn't work. Okay. So this goes back to the phenomenon of a little particle bouncing around and bouncing elastically off the walls of a container. So let's see how that works. Okay, now you're familiar with this, Debbie. Do the problem set. Okay. So, actually, I'm going to ask a few questions. Let's just see how you're doing. Okay, so I asked the panel. Well, I don't know. I don't listen. I don't think I have. You got, uh, say, rectangular, parallel, with high tension container, the x axis in this direction, implicitly. Uh, in the direction of the axis of symmetry. Uh, dimensions A by B by C, mass and velocity V. Velocity V is always in the positive or negative X direction. So this thing is just bouncing back and forth between this wall and this wall. It rides elastically with the X. Okay. And now we want to figure out the force. Okay, and what do we use? Okay, why would I ask? I got a pretty good answer. Well, you're going to do the momentum and the change in momentum and stuff like that. Well, why would you do that? Okay, never quite got the answer. Well, yeah, I did. I did finally get the answer. Uh, working from what you do, the steps of solving the problem, to a bigger picture, okay, gets you to the impulse momentum form, which is actually where you want to start. Okay. But you can go into all kinds of analysis and why the impulse momentum theorem work. Well, simply because the impulse momentum theorem says the average force is equal to the average rate of change of momentum. And that's derived by plugging F over M into the one of the two simplest equations of uniformly accelerated motion. And then you generalize that to an interval. Okay. In any case, you get the impulse momentum theorem. So, you know, why did we emphasize where the impulse momentum theorem came from in the first place? First, to contrast it with work energy, because I did get an answer about kinetic energy. Uh, well, it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't help find the average force. Okay. Uh, first of all, the total energy of the ball never changes. Uh, if the collision is elastic. Um, not going to go into quite as much detail on that as I did. But anyhow, to get the force on one end, we use the close momentum there. I could write out the count as the integral of FDT. But remember that the integral of FDT is equal to the product of the average force in the delta T. That goes back to that thing from calculus you learned over a year ago, or you're probably learning it about a year ago, the average value of a function. And if that's not firmly in your mathematical vocabulary, well, I've been telling you, how long you need to get that firmly in your mathematical vocabulary. So I can talk about average force times delta C. And the force, of course, is a vector, so I'll put a little error over. But the bar is there as it's an average. Average force times delta T equals a change in momentum. But I'm also doing that. Okay. So well, that's why we want to talk about the change in momentum. So what's a change in momentum 
at one end of this thing. Well, so there, there, there are two steps. Calculate the change in momentum, calculate the delta T. We're talking about either this or this end of the container. We can't talk about both ends at the same time. We sort of could, but we'd have to talk a little bit. Okay, so which end do you want to talk about? Well, this is one we can see. So let's talk about this. Okay. So second thought I want to talk about the right end. Just because it'd be clumsy to draw the velocity here where it'd be hidden. So I'm going to have the velocity here. Here's the bar for the mass. So it collides here, and then it comes back with the same velocity, same speed. Velocity reverses. So here's Loss of ghost to be whatever it is coming in, the negative B. So delta B is negative two B. They change the momentum is negative two M. Times B. Now, what's delta T? And you've been through the details of this, you know what these details are. So, time for the round trip. The delta T is 2C over B. Thus, average force Is negative and angry squared over C. Now, talk for just a second. What does MV squared? It's negative two KE over C. Now, I lost my vector. Make sure it did not. This is a vector, all of a sudden, it's not a vector. So, to be rigorous, I should have written this as mv squared over c times a unit vector in the direction of v. Okay. And I probably should have done that. So I'm going to do it here. You can read that, right? And then I'm going to write it over here. There's my unit vector in the direction of motion, right? At this point, it doesn't matter which end of the container that is, 
I know that the force is going to be in the direction opposite the motion. So the force is going to be toward the inside of the container. Okay. So okay, so we get Therefore, by V without the arrow, I mean the magnitude of V, which makes this a unit vector, right? And this is always a unit vector. Forming it in the container. Okay. okay, so, well, we've got the average force on one of these ends here. What's the average pressure? How do we get the average pressure? Okay, so we want to get the average pressure. Pressure is not a vector quantity. But it's the average force divided by area. The area at which the, on which this force is exerted is that end of the container. What's the area of that end? So that end has dimensions A by C, A by B. Okay. But what's that bar? It's this. So this is negative two times the kinetic energy over C. That's your average force. Mostly divided by AB. Of course, we write that out as negative two times the kinetic energy over ABC, right? What's ABC? You can show me with the figures of the letter. It's a volume. Okay. And it doesn't matter which face of the container we talk about. If we want to have the x axis still in this direction, we can rotate the container and go from this face up here to this face down here. The area is going to get bigger, but the time between collisions is going to get smaller. Okay. And the smaller time between collisions means we have more momentum change per unit of time. The rate of momentum change is going to be greater. Okay, so that's kind of neat. Now, the other thing is. What happens if we have not just one particle of mass M, but 87 trillion particles of mass M? We've got 87 million particles of mass, total mass M, okay? Whatever the total mass is. If we get 87 million particles all started in the same direction here, 
Are they going to all stay in the same direction? I said 87, I said 87 trillion. That's not even many particles. That's always a bad thing. But, um, you know, a huge number of particles. Uh, yeah, for any reasonable size container. Uh, I think mean, that's kind of hard to stop it. Uh, they're going to start bumping into each other. We're just not going to be able to position them all so they won't bump into each other. Okay. Theoretically, yeah. You know, we could put, as I said, 87 trillion, right? We just line up about uh, 9 million this way and 9 million rows there. You give them all exactly the velocity in that direction. Well, the real world doesn't work like that. First of all, they aren't going to all have the same direction. But even if they do, if first time one of them bumps into the other, then that one's going to hit a bunch of them. And pretty soon, they're all going to be going in random directions, right? Which means that a third of your kinetic energy will be going in this direction. And kinetic energy doesn't really have a direction. You get the idea. A third of it in this direction, and a third of it in whatever direction is perpendicular to this and this, which would be that direction or that direction. Okay, I had to use my right hand. I used my left hand, but it still works. It just gives me direction opposite to the actual direction. My right hand had chalk and I don't really have chalk. Okay, so, uh, well, what happens that, well, I'm gonna drag it out of you. Okay, not really necessary. Okay, so. Direction they come random. There's really no preferred direction. Even if you start them all in that direction, it just deteriorates and crazy. I've got a simulation. Somebody hasn't reconfigured all my computers, so they won't run. It's still irritation. Uh, wasn't one of our staff. Somebody asked somebody to do it, and I'm not going to get back to that. But of course, it's actually a friend of mine. <laughs> Uh, okay, so anyhow, uh, large number of particles and the directions become random. Just by the vector nature of velocity, if you got velocity, it's a result of a Vx, a Vy, and a Vz. A random velocity will have the same average. You expect on the average for all these particles that the Vx, the Vy, and the Vz will be the same. That's what it means for all the directions to be the same. And V squared, well, Pythagorean theorem says v squared just vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. This gives you what's called the law of equal, equal partition of energy. And the average kinetic energy is this. You conclude that the average kinetic energy in the x, this is the average kinetic energy in the x direction, average in the y, average in the z. It'll be three times the average kinetic energy in the x direction because the average kinetic energy in the y direction is equal to that in the x direction. So is this. So this is like three average kinetic energies in the x direction, or three in the y, three in the z. This implies.
the average kinetic energy in any one of these directions is one third of the average kinetic energy. And really, when I say you know, this kinetic energy of the, this constant kinetic energy of the single particle becomes the average kinetic energy. Okay, so you use average kinetic energy here. And the change in momentum here now becomes dependent on only the x velocity. Because the y velocity and z velocity are parallel to this, and they don't cause a collision. The y and z velocities don't change on collision, they just keep going. It's the x velocity that reverses, causing force, therefore, the pressure. Okay. And because of all that, you can replace the kinetic energy here with the average kinetic energy. But it has to be the average x kinetic energy, not about that end, the average y kinetic energy. Uh, if you're uh, talking about this phase or this phase, the average z kinetic energy, we're talking about the top to the bottom. And you think about it, that becomes one third the average kinetic energy for that reason. So now you have negative two thirds of the average kinetic energy over V. Now, of course, this means PV, what's well, two thirds of your average kinetic energy in the particles? So now, since we know the mass of an oxygen molecule, okay, we can figure out the average speed of an oxygen molecule at a given pressure and volume. Even better, we know how many moles we got and the temperature, we can calculate the average speed of the particle. It doesn't matter what particle it is, whether it's an oxygen molecule, nitrogen molecule, carbon dioxide, or a bullet ball. Okay. <coughs> Wrong, wrong. This is a constant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's something. Um, I probably have time to fix it. Because we're talking about particles. This is the average kinetic energy of all the particles. Kinetic energy of all the particles. Mm -hmm. 
just to figure out where to write it. If capital N is the number of particles, this allows you to get the average kinetic energy of a particle. Um, so there's a jump from here to here, and I really should have set this up a little bit differently. This is the average kinetic energy divided by the number of particles, which is the average kinetic energy per particle. And K Holds them a constant 1.38 times 10 to the negative 43 joules per particle Kelvin. Okay. Um, you can see that if this is joules per particle Kelvin degree multiplied by temperature. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. It's like you used to have this chemistry. Okay. You apply the gas laws, temperature is absolute temperature, and that's meaning the introductory process. So the Kelvin degrees would uh, divide out so that we come out in joules per particle. As you multiply that by temperature, you get joules per particle, okay? So if you know the mass of the particle, you calculate the velocity, and you find that the molecules are bouncing off you Atmospheric creating atmospheric pressure or, or responding to atmospheric pressure, et cetera, and temperature and all that stuff. Um, have speeds approaching the speed of sound. And if there's helium in there, it's several times the speed of sound. Okay. But your oxygen, nitrogen molecules have speeds on the order of the speed of sound. They're moving really fast. Okay. If a bowling ball hit you with the same momentum that one of those have, you wouldn't feel it. But have the same momentum as that particle that you don't feel. It wouldn't be moving very fast at all. <laughs> okay. If it was this far away from you, you'd wait a lifetime for it to hit you. <laughs> okay. So it's really neat stuff. Just by taking this model and what we can measure. The PV equals NRT, we measure in a lab. We've done measurements. Okay, I don't know how much you think of pressure, but you know. and we'll do some stuff on Friday. Okay. Uh, but stuff you can measure with PV equals NRT with gases that approximate ideal gases. Um, you can determine molecular speeds. Of course, we haven't done enough electromagnetism. Figure out how you calculate the speed of an oxygen molecule. You ionize it, put it in a magnetic field, and you measure the radius of its correction. Okay, pretty simple. We're not there yet. <laughs>